just how long he'll be able to maintain that balance. Alexandra Byers, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Uh, for more on this, let's bring in our guests. Uh, in Hanoi is Richard Haydarian. Uh, he's an academic and author of books such as Asia's New Battlefield, U.S.-China, and The Struggle for the Western Pacific. In Washington, D.C. is Gregory Poling, director of the Southeast Asia Programme and Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. And Andrew Lung is a China policy analyst who joins us from Hong Kong. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in Hanoi with Richard Hey, Darren. Richard, the biggest military exercise that the US and the Philippines have ever taken place. Manila now promising more military bases within the Philippines itself for uh, the US. And now you have the Chinese uh, foreign minister visiting. Is this a case of too little, too late for the Chinese? Are they trying to play catch up mm -hmm. now? Right. I mean, on the one hand, the Philippines is kind of in a strategic sweet spot where I think it has a better bargaining position when it comes to dealing with China, because right now we have revitalized our alliance with the United States in ways that we didn't do in the past six years or so under former President Rodrigo Duterte. I think what's happening here is the Philippines is correcting under President Marcos Jr. the excessive and fruitless flirtation with China. Uh, when you had a situation where President Duterte you know, did not assert our arbitration case in the South China Sea, he tried to downgrade or kind of in fact, undermine our alliance with the United States. And he was offered billions of dollars in investments in China. And yet, after six years of Duterte's presidency, not much concrete big ticket infrastructure investments came in from China. And to make matters worse, actually, the situation in the South China Sea, where the Philippines and China have maritime disputes, actually deteriorated. So, President Marcos Jr., in fairness to him, tried to give this relationship with China a chance. In fact, he visited China earlier this year in January. But if you look at the long joint statement that came out, practically no serious concessions from China, whether on infrastructure investments, a lot of them were pledge trapped and debt trapped, nor was there any concessions from China on the South China Sea front. So the Philippines, realizing that it doesn't have much of a bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis China and that it has had a fruitless people's towards China, is now going back to its traditional allies. So what is the lesson for China? The lesson for China is that you cannot have the Philippines on the chip. If you want to have a better relationship with the Philippines, you have to offer something concretely to us, literally concretely in terms of investments, but also, more importantly, when it comes to the territorial disputes in the South China Sea. Andrew, would you agree with that? You can't have a relationship, China can't have a relationship with the Philippines on the cheap, that it needs to be fruitful. The word that, uh, that um, Richard used was fruitless. Would you agree with any of that? Well, first of all, you look got to look at the uh, relationship. It's not just between the Philippines and China. Uh, it is between uh, China and the United States um, involving uh, the South China Sea and Taiwan. A, a much bigger picture than just relationship between uh, Philippines and China. Um, now, let's not forget that the Philippines has got a um, defense um, kind of agreement, uh, which is renewed, um, I think, every couple of years. Um, and and uh, under the agreement, uh, the United States is given access to different assets uh, in the Philippines. It seems that recently um, this agreement, uh, some sort of a court, has been reached with the United States, trying to play both sides. Um, in other words, um, uh, uh, Philippines would uh, like to benefit uh, from the U.S. Uh, military presence as a counterweight against China. Uh, but of course, the Philippines is not in the Philippines' interest uh, to provoke a regional war um, uh, over Taiwan or over other uh, waters, uh, because immediately it would impinge on uh, using um, the Philippines as a collateral uh, damage. That would be very serious for 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 the Philippines. And now, what it seems that uh, is it's not a sweet spot; it's a very dangerous and delicate spot because uh, by um, allowing American military presence uh, in uh, the Philippines, in case that there is a uh, a war uh, over Taiwan, for example, these military mm. assets, American military assets, could be mobilized and were subject to retaliation, military uh, retaliation uh, from Beijing, uh, using missiles or, or other uh, bombardment and uh, hurting um, uh, the Philippines um, uh, uh, nation and, and the people. So I think it's a very delicate spot. Um, uh, Gregory, because, uh, I'm just, Gregory I will come to you. Gregory, I will come to you in just a second, but I just want to push Andrew on one of his points. Andrew, right now, though, right now, at this moment, it's the U.S. 
that are winning this relationship with the Philippines. It's not China. That billions of dollars worth of investment that China promised under successive governments of the Philippines didn't materialize. So right now, the U.S. does have the upper hand in the Philippines over China. Surely that's what it looks like. Yes. Um, I think the United States, of course, is, um, has, uh, has got an upper hand, hand uh, militarily. Uh, as I said, uh, there is a uh, president uh, military uh, accord with the Philippines, long, which has been lasting for quite a, quite, quite, quite a number of years already. Uh, and then um, American, uh, the, the United States, did um, uh, deploy military assets in the Philippines. And after the recent uh, kind of um, um, negotiations between the Philippines and the United States, and there had been some sort of agreement uh, to continue to allow the American access to this military as assets inside the Philippines. What I'm trying to say is that um, while the United States has got um, a leverage over the Philippines, uh, the United States does not necessarily have leverage over China. Because um, let's not forget, uh, A, the Chinese Navy has been um, is larger than the United States in terms of numbers. But secondly, um, the waters in uh, over the Taiwan Strait um, is much nearer uh, to China than the United States. And, and of course, China has got the anti-access, uh, area denial missiles or aircraft killing missiles, uh, and also uh, remote control drones uh, and underwater uh, assets uh, that can e uh, deny uh, the intervention by the United States. But on the other hand, this is no formula to, provo to, to prevent uh, a hot war. And, uh, and whenever a hot war happens, right. then the military assets inside the Philippines could be collateral damage. That's the point right. I'm trying to make. Well, let's bring in uh, Gregory Polling here. We've just been talking about Navy. We're talking about maritime. Clearly, the Philippines an archipelago of islands. But these are two countries that cannot actually agree on even what to call it. China calls it the South China Seas. The Philippines calls it the West Philippines Sea. It's crucial uh, what's going on when it comes to the maritime, when it comes to the, the both navies uh, in the area, no? Cần taxi, gọi ngay trên ví VNPay, ứng dụng ngân hàng Việt Tinh Agribank, BIDV. Bao cả tháng, đặt taxi ngay. Bà con nào mà đang bị đau mỏi cổ nè, vai gáy nè, sưng khớp nè, cứng khớp nè, viêm đa khớp nè, là thoái quá đốt sống cổ, rồi à, à, vôi hóa cái cuộc sống của mình, rồi thoát vị đĩa đệm. Mình sử dụng ngay cái sữa White Store Canxi này nha cả nhà. Đây là một cái sản phẩm từ Pháp nha mọi người. Thật sự là à, không có phí một cái ngàn nào của quý vị đâu. Tường cảm nhận là chất lượng rất là xứng đáng với cái đồng tiền mà mình bỏ ra. Đau nhức xương khớp nè, mỏi cổ vai gáy nè, rồi viêm khớp nè, sưng khớp nè, thoái quá khớp nè Hay là mình vận động mình đi lại đó, mà mình gặp những cái khó khăn Mình đã cũng đã từng sử dụng nhiều cái loại sản phẩm rồi, tay ta rồi Nhưng mà mình chưa đỡ, thì đó là do mọi người chưa biết thôi Mọi người chưa sử dụng cái sữa Waisu Canxi này thôi nha Khi mà Tường uống là chỉ đâu khoảng tầm 10 ngày thôi nha Là Tường đã cảm nhận được một cái hiệu quả rõ rệt luôn Bớt đau mỏi nè, mình đi lại vận động nó dễ dàng hơn Và những cái lúc mà trái gió trở trời thì Tường cũng không có lo là nó đau nhức xương khớp nữa Tường không có lo là bị loãng xương nha quý vị Thói quá nè Rồi những cái biến chứng của xương khớp nữa nha cả nhà Tường dùng cái sữa quai xua canxi này á, là được một thời gian rồi Thì Tường cảm thấy là nó sẽ bản thân mình sẽ giảm phụ thuộc vào thuốc tây Thuốc giảm đau Cho nên là Tường cảm thấy là mình cũng rất là yên tâm Mọi người nghe Tường nha Mọi người nghe Tường nha Rồi bây giờ thì khi mình đã biết rồi á Mình đã sử dụng cái sữa quai xua canxi này rồi Thì là mình sẽ không lo gì nữa hết á Mình không có phải chịu khổ nè Mình phải bị đau nhức xương khớp nữa đâu cả nhà Không riêng gì Tường đâu Bạn bè Tường nè Đồng nghiệp của Tường nè Người thân của Tường nè Bất kỳ ai mà gặp những cái vấn đề về xương khớp á thì tường đã giới thiệu uống cái sữa quai xua canxi này rồi đó và mọi người uống là điều rất là hiệu quả luôn à, sử dụng rất là tốt nha à, mọi người ơi cái sữa quai xua canxi này á là từ pháp là từ chia sẻ lại pháp thì mọi người biết rồi đây là cái quốc gia số 1 về các cái sản phẩm dinh dưỡng đúng không cả nhà cho nên là chất lượng thì mình cũng không cần phải lo lắng gì hết và sản phẩm này cũng được viện hàn lâm khoa học và công nghệ nghiên cứu và chuyển giao với công nghệ à, chỉ từ sử dụng 10 ngày thôi là tường đã cảm thấy là tay chân của mình á, nó sẽ giảm giảm rất là nhiều nó không còn đau nhức nữa không còn mình có những cái cảm giác là mình tê bì chân tay á mọi người nó nhức nhức giống như là có kiến bò ở trong xương của mình vậy đó nó sẽ không còn những cái tình trạng đó nữa nha cả nhà cho nên là những ai mà mình đang gặp những cái vấn đề về xương khớp nè À, mỏi cổ vai gáy nè, rồi mình viêm khớp nè, sưng khớp nè, thoái hóa khớp nè, hay là mình vận động, mình đi lại mà mình gặp những cái khó khăn thì mình hãy uống ngay dùm cho tường cái sữa Waisu Canxi này nha. Nhãn hàng 
sữa Waisu Canxi đang có một cái chương trình hỗ trợ cho quý vị khách hàng khi mà mua sản phẩm này thì sẽ được giảm tới là 40% nha cả nhà nha và mọi người nhanh tay để lại số điện thoại hoặc là mình liên hệ trực tiếp với cái số hotline nhãn hàng đang ghi trên màn hình luôn và đồng thời khi mình mua ba lon sữa Waisu Canxi thì mình sẽ được tặng một lon là 850 g nha mình mua bốn lon sữa Waisu Canxi thì mình sẽ được tặng là hai lon 850 g mình mua năm lon sữa Waisu Canxi thì mình sẽ được tặng ba lon 850 g nha cả nhà nha quá lời đúng không quý vị quá lời luôn và đây là cái ưu đãi lớn nhất và đặc biệt à, được cái nhãn hàng hỗ trợ cho mình và chỉ duy nhất trong cái livestream của tường ngày hôm nay thôi cho nên là cả nhà ơi mình nhanh tay nha để là cái số điện thoại nè hoặc là mình có thể là gọi mình liên hệ trực tiếp với số hotline mà nhãn hàng tôi đã ghim trên cái livestream này của các tường rồi để trở thành những khách hàng nhanh nhất nhận được ưu đãi nha giảm giá ngay 40 phần trăm trong ngày hôm nay luôn Yeah, look, absolutely. I think we, when we talk about the U.S. Building Alliance, when we talk about the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, the expansion of um, U.S. access to Philippine bases, and you say, why is all this happening? And the answer is the South China Sea and the inability or unwillingness in Beijing to recognize that its policies in the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea pushed Manila to this point. I think it's the fundamental problem right now between Beijing and Manila, because from the Philippines' point of view, it's responding to external threats from China. From China's point of view, the Philippines has no agency here. It's not making any of its own decisions. It's a dupe of the Americans, uh, which is, of course, extraordinarily offensive to Philippine policymakers, and it means that the two sides are talking across from each other. Richard, is this a strategic mistake on behalf of the Philippines? What Andrew was saying is that, OK, They might be the power in the Philippines right now, but the U.S. doesn't control China. China ultimately is its own person, its own man. So mm -hmm. you're making a mistake. Well, here. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that Greg mentioned a very important word, strategic agency. Uh, I, I love that our friend in China mentioned, or Hong Kong mentioned, that uh, this is really just about U.S. and China as if none of us matter in the region, it's just about them. I don't think that's true. I think a lot of us have agency in this part of region. We're all sovereign states. We want to make decisions accordingly. What I also find very interesting is what I call strategic gaslighting. Uh, as far as provocation is concerned, the threat is not coming from the Philippines. The Philippines is not threatening China or Taiwan, nor is the United States. The threat of invasion of Taiwan is coming from China. The bullying happening in the West Philippines here or South China here or whatever you want to call it, it's not from the Philippines. It's not from the United States. So countries like the Philippines gave it a chance under Duterte. We were we had the we should have got the gold medal for loyalty to China. We did the best we could do under President Duterte to make the situation better for China. And yet we really didn't get much in exchange. So I think right now China has to do some soul searching. You know, they may have the biggest uh, or navy in this part of the world, but You know, U.S. is not alone. U.S. has Japan there. U.S. has South Korea there. U.S. has Australia there. It's not just the Philippines. And by the way, the Philippines is just trying to be in a position of preparation. And Philippines wants to help efforts in the region to deter invasion of Taiwan, because Taiwan is closer to the Philippines than most Southeast Asian countries. And the Philippines also wants to expedite the modernization of its armed forces by better alliance with the United States. But let's, let's not make any mistake. Marcos Jr. does not want to just side with the U.S. against China. He just wants to strengthen his country's position. I think we still want to have the best possible relationship we can have with China. But it's a give and take. And if China cannot even accept the Philippines agency and just sees us as a puppet of America, good luck with that. Gregory, but post the Second World War, the Philippines did have a pretty great relationship with both China and with the U.S. In fact, um, it's prided itself as being one of the places that can talk to all of the superpowers, including regional superpowers. So has something gone wrong here, do you think, since uh, Duterte was in power? Do you think something has broken? Superbet Gold với tiếp tục phần cải thiện giấc ngủ. Superbet Gold dinh dưỡng toàn diện ăn ngủ ngon. Yeah, not just since Duterte. I mean, the, you're right that from the mid 1970s when ties were normalized under Marco Senior on, the Philippines did pursue very positive relations with China until the 1990s. And in the 1990s, you began to see the acceleration of the South China Sea disputes. China occupied Mr. Freeth in the Philippine exclusive economic zone. It began more uh, frequently harassing Filipino fishers at Scarborough Shoal, which the Philippines had administered since the end of World War II. And that really took off under the Aquino government with the seizure of Scarborough and then the island building campaign that caught uh, international headlines. So what you see in public opinion polling and elite opinion polling is that China has gone from being seen as a partner and a, and a uh, economic opportunity 
in the Philippines to being seen as an external threat, first and foremost. Uh, Andrew, let me bring you in here. What we're talking about, I want to talk to you about hierarchy. China, obviously a very big power, has huge influence in Africa, has huge influence in South Asia, has investments all over the world, practically. How important is the Philippines to China? Well, I think that the um, Beijing regards the Philippines as a friend rather than as an enemy. Um, there is a great uh, um, economic relationship between the Philippines and China, as e uh, evidenced by the recent um, state visit by President Marcos to Beijing. Um, and this relationship has been solidified. But what I'm trying to say is that the um, uh, Philippines, um, by allowing uh, the um, uh, assets uh, inside Philippines to be used by the mili uh, American military, uh, would subject itself to the risks and the possibility that in case of a war happening uh, over the South China Sea, over um, uh, uh, the region, uh, those military assets inside the Philippines could jeopardize the security uh, and 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 safety to, of the Philippine people because they they were subject to bombardment by by um, um, retaliation by by China now. But looks let's look at the risks uh, of such a war. Um, and naturally, China doesn't want a war over the South China Sea, and China does want uh, uh, Taiwan to be uh, united with China peacefully. And this is endorsed by three uh, um, serial white paper published by Beijing. Uh, the last one immediately following the Nancy Pelosi visit, all stressing the preference for peaceful unification. But the fact remains that most Taiwan people do not want unification, but neither do most of them want independence. They want to maintain the status quo. But while the United States is trying to play the Taiwan card, trying to create more and more diplomatic space for Taiwan to play, as if Taiwan was a separate country, uh, and also um, allowing uh, more and more senior um, um, American leaders uh, to visit Taiwan as if Taiwan was a separate country. So this is trying to hollowing out um, the, the, the one China, China policy. Uh, and then if um, Taiwan should uh, be allowed to declare formal independence, that was triggered a war. So I think that this war, uh, in as far as the Philippines is concerned, uh, is not a party to it. But unfortunately, by allowing the American military assets inside the Philippines, these assets could well be used by the United States uh, uh, for this war. And and by using this um, military assets, it was subject the Philippines to um, bombardment by um, retaliation by, 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 by Beijing in case such a war happens. This is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Gregory, there is an interesting parallel to be drawn here. And I want to talk about Russia and Ukraine. One of the warnings that the Russians gave the uh, Ukrainians was don't get too close to NATO. You know, one of the warnings they gave the West was this is in our sphere of influence. Just do not get involved here. This is this is Russian sphere of influence. China seems to be doing the same thing with the South China Seas. It seems to be saying to the West, to NATO, to America, uh, that this is our sphere of influence. We're talking about Taiwan. They always mention Taiwan, as Andrew just did. This is a dangerous precedent. It's a dangerous time. Uh, you could be walking blindly into a conflict. The US could blunder into a conflict here, surely. I don't think the US is um, Pollyannish here. I think the Biden administration understands that the, re the, the risk of accidental escalation across the region, not just in the Taiwan Strait, but in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, on the Indian border, is getting increasingly high, and, and a large part of that is because of Beijing's unwillingness to compromise on any of these issues with its neighbors. And for the U.S., there is a, a balancing act here. It wants to um, put up guardrails, maintain strategic communication, prevent escalation, but the U.S. is also getting a lot of demand signal from its partners, right? And it has to respond if it wants to continue to be seen as the partner of choice, as the regional security provider. So when the Philippines comes knocking on America's doors, and says, we need help because China keeps trying to starve our troops out in the Spratly Islands every six weeks, the U.S. has to say yes. When Japan complains, when India complains, when Korea complains, when Vietnam complains, they come to the U.S. as a balancer. And I come back to the point I made earlier. One of the fundamental problems here is you ask China about the Philippines, and China wants to talk about Taiwan. China refuses to recognize that the Philippines has any legitimate reason to fear China, that China has done anything over the last decade 
to drive the Philippines to the decisions it's made. Uh, Richard, we are talking about Taiwan because it has been brought up. You were talking about uh, the idea that the Philippines is a sovereign nation, that it should be able to develop relations with any country it wants. But the bottom line is, is that China's got a priority. It's Taiwan. And by allowing the Americans in, you're walking a dangerous path. Well, I would also want to mention that Taiwan also has an agency, right? So I think Andrew correctly pointed out, we also have to watch out where they're going to elect soon. They're going to have a presidential election very soon. So let's hope that on the part of Taiwan also, they played their cards well so that they don't give anyone any excuse to do anything crazier out of the box. Now, speaking of the Philippines, the reality is that we're just too geographically close to Taiwan uh, to sit this out or... And at the same time, we're a U.S. ally. We cannot be neutral because a lot of war games suggest that, including war game, I think, conducted by Gregory Pauling's institution last year, suggests that uh, southern Taiwan's shores could be one point of entry for a potential Chinese kinetic action. And that's just over 100 nautical miles from some of the Philippine bases in Mavulis, in Fuga, among others. By the way, we didn't open those bases to Americas or not yet. But the reality is that the Philippines is just close to the too much close, too close to the Taiwan theater to be a neutral. And we're a U.S. ally, so we're not going to be neutral. So imagine a situation: there's a war between U.S. and China. American troops are getting killed or wounded, and then we say we're neutral. So that's why, in in recognition of that potential nightmare situation, what we want to do, at least, is what Marcus Jr. wants to do, is to prepare for that, and hopefully by having a collective, strong stance together with U.S. but also with Japan among others deter China from even invading Taiwan. Because I think that's a lesson we are drawing from Ukraine. The reason why Ukraine was invaded was because it was not backed up enough. Had Ukraine had more um, defense cooperation or assurances from the NATO, from the U.S., I think Russia would have fought it twice. And I think China is way more rational, less more aggressive and reckless than Russia or Putin's Russia. So I think if the Philippines, Japan, and U.S. play their card well through integrated deterrence strategy, perhaps, we can deter or make China think twice about any kinetic action in the near future. After all, even Andrew said China doesn't want war too, but we have to prepare for it. If you want peace, you have to prepare for war. I mean, Andrew, China isn't looking for a war. I mean, I think we can confidently say that, but it might have been easier just to buy the Philippines off. Committed? Why didn't, the, why didn't China just commit to the billions of dollars it promised the previous government in investment? I think that, uh, as I pointed out, um, um, Philippines is a, um, is within this uh, a, a regional a comprehensive economic partnership, uh, the world's largest trading bloc, accounting for a third of the world's GDP, a third of the world's population, uh, of which the Philippines, of course, is a very important trading partner. But less, but that cannot be used um, as um, to override uh, China's territorial. Um, uh, interest, particularly over Taiwan. So if push comes uh, push comes to to, to show, um, and the American assets uh, in the Philippines are being used uh, in such a war, then the Philippines would necessarily be dragged in, not because China wants it, but because of the presence of these American uh, military assets in, in uh, the Philippines. Now, as far as the uh, Ukraine situation is concerned, um, there is a perception in Beijing uh, that uh, the United States wants to provoke China into taking untimely action so that China could be dragged into a Ukrainian-type quagmire. Um, so as to arrest uh, China's rise and to uh, thwart things of full navy uh, application would uh, like a card to, to military bases. So there's a way for both China and for the US to coexist within the Philippines itself, and that's simply by doing what they're doing, keeping the status quo. Is that something that the government is taking seriously, the US government? I think it's absolutely... Correct. When, if you look at the speeches made by the secretaries of foreign affairs and defense for the Philippines last week when they were in uh, Washington for the two plus two meeting with their U.S. counterparts, they both stressed time and time again that they want positive relations, economic relations with China, 
and a closer military alliance with the Americans, and the, they see that as key to the Philippines' independent foreign policy, which is not quite the same as neutrality, but it means the Philippines gets to make its own decisions. It is not beholden to U.S. strategic decision-making. And their American counterparts said time and again, we get it. We, we agree. We support that. The real question, though, is, is the current status quo actually stable? And while we think so much about the Taiwan Strait, for obvious reasons, the fact is that Every few weeks, a Filipino Coast Guard ships getting violently harassed by a Chinese vessel in the South China Sea. That's where the status quo is likely to break. And so I think China cannot maintain its current uh, hyper aggressive posture in the South China Sea and expect the Philippines not to continue to drift closer to the Americans. Uh, Richard Hardering, we are running out of time, but I do want to end with you. This idea of the status quo, which is clearly what Philippines is doing. It's managing a relationship between China and uh, between the United States. But that's going to take a lot of political skill. Does this government have that political skill? I don't think I want to vouch for Marco Jr. yet, but I think he has done far better than many people expected from him the other year. In fact, the expectation of most so-called experts was that Marcus Jr. will be kind of like a Duterte 2.0. He'll finish off what Duterte could not, which is essentially making the Philippines like a vassal state of China and a very unreliable or just a kind of a superficial ally of the U.S. And yet that's not what's happened. I think Marcus Jr. is someone who was part of his father's efforts of normalizing ties with China back in the day in 1970s. He has a lot of experience with geopolitics on a personal level, and, I, and he has many, many good advisors around him. So I'm cautiously optimistic that he will not be foolish enough to provoke China, but also not foolish enough to do what his predecessor did. Therefore, I think what he will do is to constantly hedge, keep the alliance with the United States strong enough so that we're not too weak and we have bargaining position with China, but at the same time, not to make it too strong and too in your face so that it will undermine our diplomatic and economic relations with China. It's going to be absolutely difficult. But our hope is it will work, because if it doesn't work, all of us are going to be troubled. By the way, I'm, Vietnam, I'm in Vietnam right now, and our hope is not only Philippines, but Philippines will work with other ASEAN countries with similar concerns with China so that we can have an effective collective front in dealing with it. That's why the role of ASEAN is also very important in how we address these problems in this part of the world. I want to thank all our guests, uh, Richard Hadarian, Gregory Pauling and Andrew Lung, and I want to thank you.